All right, I'm here. Thank you so much for joining us on a Wednesday, halfway through the week. Twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live. Wherever you might be joining us from. Thank you so much for being a part of my Wednesday and of 110 Sports Wednesday. My name is Josh, and this is the J Mole Show. We got a lot to get to today. We do. Um, we're, we're, we're getting really close to football. And, and, and football's not the, the topic of conversation today, but, like, we're getting really close, which is, I mean, we're a week to, a week from tomorrow. You got NFL football. Like, the Chiefs are going to play in a week. And, and, and I guess it's because we don't have the preseason. So, like, the preseason, you don't have the preseason to watch it. You have the preseason so that you are reminded that it's almost time to watch football. I don't mean that completely, but like I watch maybe a quarter of preseason football, just not that big of a deal, but you're hyped up, ready to go when the football season hits the ground running. And without a preseason, it's like, oh, right. The Chiefs play in a week. It's September 2nd. It's time for football. And of course, 2020 being the way that it is. And the fact that it's still sort of like, really, we're, we're about to play football in this, in this climate is, um, is still a little surprising and it's not not hyped up as much but it's certainly got more variables other than let's go it's football time it's time to tailgate it's time to watch football weekend it's a little different for sure but we're going to get into some football here in the next few days uh, today though at 11 20 we're going to talk to chris brown our 110 sports baseball guy Yo, he's pumping out the con. First of all, if you're not following him on Twitter at C Brown Sports, you're doing it wrong. You need to follow him on Twitter. He's on top of things. He's got power rankings. He's got multiple Major League Baseball stories every week. Uh, he's got winners and losers of the trade deadline. Trade deadline was this past Monday. So if you're not following him, you're doing it wrong. Especially if you're a baseball fan. He's very, very good uh, at keeping everyone up to date uh, with. Uh, the season now and was really good at it at, at keeping people updated uh, in the conversation with COVID-19 and some of the issues that baseball had before the season started so if you're not following him you should and you should stick around at 11 25 when we talk to him about the trade deadline we're halfway through the season roughly a, a little bit over halfway through uh, we'll just talk to him about the season in general some of his biggest surprises uh, as well as winners and losers of the trade deadline very excited about that conversation we'll do some fyi at the end of the show and and get out of here for the wednesday but what i want to start with is once again the nba playoffs we had we have this is the best part of the nba playoffs like the, these periods where you've got games that are going to 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 game seven and are very competitive like these rockets and thunder series um which game seven of that series is tonight and then you have you had the Nuggets and Jazz last night. We're going to talk about that for sure. But then you're also in this mode of the beginning of series that are much more competitive than their predecessors. The Bucks, the Heat, the Raptors, and the Celtics lost a total of one game between the four of them in the first round. Now they get to play each other, so somebody's going to lose, and it's much more interesting and much more competitive, and there's a lot to talk about. We'll get to both of those series in the the Eastern semifinals, both of those series starting Game 2 of the Raptors-Celtics series was yesterday. Game 2 of the Heat and Bucks is this afternoon. So we'll get to those here in a second, but where I want to start is with the conclusion of the Jazz Nuggets series. Listen, the winning team in this series scored 135 124 124 129 117 119 game seven's winner 80 points the jazz won 80 to 78 and mike conley let me tell you mike conley had a really good look at the end of the game to to send the jazz to the second round i thought it was going in i really did and, and being from Memphis, being the lifelong Mike Conley fan that I am, oh, I wanted it to go in. I wanted it to go in so bad, but it didn't, and the Nuggets move on, complete the 3-1 comeback. Uh, 
in you know three straight games 117 107 119 107 and then 80 to 78 it's a completely different it's a completely different change in in the way that this series went down and of course that's that comes as a result of the fact that you know Jamal Murray and Donovan Mitchell in game six combined for I believe it was 94 points Murray had 50 and Donovan Mitchell had 44 I believe that was the case um the two combined last night for 39 and that was the difference and and I think you know of course this wasn't sustainable and, and nobody was questioning that Jamal Murray and Donovan Mitchell were going to score 50 every night and like I don't know about you guys, but I almost was, I won't say I was positive, but I was, I would have bet money that both of them were under 30 points in this game. Because you knew that there was gonna, the intensity was going to be a little higher, there was going to be some more pressure on the ball, because that was the thing, Donovan Mitchell was just taking wide open jumpers off the pick and roll, because nobody was pressuring him to, to give up the ball, to make a move, he was just taking wide open jump shots all day and Jamal Murray was just playing phenomenally and at some point those shots aren't going to go in and for both of them that was last night Donovan Mitchell 9 of 22 from the field 22 points 9 rebounds only one assist Murray struggled even just slightly more than he did 7 of 21 he ended up with 17 points he dished out four assists um the difference here there are a couple differences here one the Jazz had 12 turnovers in this game, and Donovan Mitchell was responsible for nine of them. Jamal Murray did a slightly better job of impacting this game without scoring well. He had four assists, a couple of rebounds, only turned it over twice. He was slightly better outside of the fact that he didn't play well in the scoring department he missed a it was halfway i think it was like four minutes left in the third in the fourth quarter and he just had a wide open three it was they got they lost him in transition he made a pass and then sort of curled around the outside uh down the baseline and ended up on the wing all alone and just and missed the shot and then that's the that's been jamal murray's issue oh i, I don't even want to call it an issue because it's just the way that he is. He's not a univ- He's not a career efficient scorer. What he's been doing in the playoffs is is very unprecedented for for him. And he's not a great three point shooter. He was one of six in this game. He was only shooting like 34 percent from the three point line. So now he's a he's a functional three point shooter, and he looks like a guy that should shoot it well, and he plays like a guy that that should shoot it well. And and to a certain extent, you know his his volume is high and 34 percent is is what i would expect from a guy who shoots a lot of threes and doesn't get a lot of doesn't get a lot of passes into those threes it's why steph curry is so ridiculous that he shoots around 40 percent every year taking the shots that he does and shooting the threes that he does because while he works really hard to come off screens he does a lot of shooting quickly off of the pick and roll and shooting in transition just pulling up in transition shooting from narnia so this was uh, this was expected at some point. And what it came down to is that I mean Donovan Mitchell, you know, he had nine turnovers. Murray hit some big shots down the stretch for sure. So he stepped up uh, right, you know, late in the game when they needed a bucket and they definitely did that but, but the difference, the ultimate difference in this game and and the reason, one of the reasons why Originally, I thought the Jazz had no chance in this series. Was after Donovan Mitchell, you're not really sure who the next guy is. It could be Mike Conley. Mike Conley had a he he really struggled in this game. Was two of thirteen from the floor and one of six from the three point line after playing really well in the first in the three games. His first three games back, three games back. I think that was it. Jordan Clarkson played really well at the early part of this series. He struggled in game six and then was just four of nine from the field for 10 points, one of five from the three-point line in game seven. 
you're not ch- I, I and Rudy Gobert while he's one of the three best defensive players in the game he had he had 19 and 18 you're not asking Rudy Gobert to score the basketball but he had a great game eight of 13 from the floor a pair of blocks 18 rebounds 19 points whale of a game but he's not Nikola Jokic <laughs> And that's where, and and that this is part of the reason that I thought, I just thought that the Jazz weren't going to be able to score with the Nuggets, and and in the last three games, to a certain extent, that that was the case. Not really in this one, but in the in the two games prior, that tied up the series. When Murray's not going, you still have Jokic, who's an All NBA caliber player. He had thirty points. 14 rebounds, 4 assists on 12 of 23 shooting. That was the difference right there. And, and and it's sort of the, I think it was a microcosm of why I didn't think the Jazz had a chance in this series. Because if Donovan Mitchell doesn't play well, and Rudy Gobert gives you 20 and 20 essentially, you still only score 78 points. The Nuggets won this game with 80 points. And they got literally nothing from players not named Jokic and Murray. Like, Jokic had 30, Murray had 17, Michael Porter had 10. Nobody else had more than 7. They were 8 of 31 from the 3-point line. Only shot 13 free throws and were 37% from the field and still won the game. Because they won, they scored, they made one more shot. One more 2-point field goal. Like, literally, that was the difference. Now, that makes sense, but it wasn't free throws or anything. They both made eight three-pointers, and they both made ten free throws. One more two-point basket. The Jazz didn't get anything from players not named Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. And the Nuggets didn't get anything from players not named Murray and Jokic, but they just got more from Jokic because he's so much more dynamic on the offensive end than Rudy Gobert is. And that's essentially what this came down to. And, and and I didn't think that we'd see a full stop in the offense to the tune of 80 to 78. But I thought there was a good chance that this game would not be very high scoring. And listen, if I mean, we're talking about Utah only scoring 109 points, 107 points. In game two, I mean, excuse me, game six, when Mitchell has 44. I, I like, I'm not entirely sure. Like, it makes a lot of sense that they really struggled to score and only scored 78 points when Mitchell wasn't elite and Conley struggled. Conley was, was a pretty consistent 20 since he came back from the birth of his child. With that being said, the mutual respect at the end of that game between Donovan Mitchell and and Jamal Murray was very cool to see. Those are two guys that are going to be around for a long time. And before we we move on to the East, we need to relax about this Dwayne Wade-Donovan Mitchell conversation, at least for like one more year. Like one more year, maybe. Like, Like I'm all for it. I really am. And, and Donovan Mitchell possesses a lot of the things that I think Dwayne Wade possesses. But we're talking about an all-timer in Dwayne Wade. One of the best shooting guards ever. And it, and it, it might be more disrespectful to Dwayne Wade than it is respectful to Donovan Mitchell. He's great, but he's in year three. Let's take a deep breath and come back to this in a little while. Just, just give it a little while longer. A little while longer. Dwayne Wade came into the NBA in 2003, I believe. Yes, he was the number five. He was the fifth pick in 2003. He won an NBA championship in 2006. That means that next year. 
Donovan Mitchell needs to win a title. He's not going to win a title next year. He was the NBA Finals MVP in 2006. Let's just rely. It's my least favorite thing about the sports world is this un this uncontrollable desire to compare everybody to everybody. Let's just relax. Why don't you give Donovan Mitchell his chance to be Donovan Mitchell before you try to make him Dwayne Wade? Because I guarantee you, if you ask Donovan Mitchell what he thought about the comparisons to Dwayne Wade, he would say, I'm, I'm flattered. But I'm trying to be Donovan Mitchell. I'm not trying to be Dwayne Wade. Donovan Mitchell's not going out there trying to be Dwayne Wade. We're trying to make him Dwayne Wade. Just leave him alone. Let him be Donovan Mitchell. Instead of fueling this desire instead to connect him to Dwayne Wade. It's just unnecessary, so we should we should stop doing it. On the Celtics side of things, it was another day. I mean, 6 of 16 Siakam. Did I say Raptors? Who did I say? Did I say Celtics? This Celtics Raptors series. Siakam, 6 of 16 for 17 points. Lowry, 5 of 16 for 16 points. Van Vliet, 8 of 22 for 19 points. Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet combined for 3 of 19 from the three-point line. Celtics, big guys. Jason Tatum, 34 on 8 of 17 shooting, 14 of 14 from the free-throw line. Six rebounds, eight rebounds, six assists. Kimball Walker, 17, 6, and 4. He had a, a, a not as great shooting night, but still. Marcus Smart, 6 of 11 from the three point line. If he's shooting like that, the series is over. If he's going to come in and give that kind of production on the offensive end of things, the series is over. Jalen Brown, 16. He had a, a, a not great night either, as well. But 16, 8, and 2. You got, I mean, Robert Williams is torching. I don't think Robert Williams is missed in this series yet. He was 5-5 five of five last time. I'm pretty sure he was 5-5 five of five in game one. I'm looking. Yes, Robert Williams is 10 of 10 from the field. He's missed more free throws in this series than field goals. You can't let that... I mean, poor the only person who is, who's against this is poor Ennis Cantor, who hasn't played yet in this series because... Robert Williams has been so good. And Grant Williams has been solid too. But man, this is just... I mean, this is exactly... Boston's three biggest players. Toronto's biggest three players. Boston's biggest three players have been better in almost every way. In both games. And it was even more striking in game one. I mean, game one was never close. And that was why. Was never close. This is going to have to change. I mean, this this game was close. But Siakam's got to be better. 6 of 16 from the field. And when the game slows down, fast break points here. 16 for Toronto. That's a good amount of fast break points, but they have to be able to score in the half court. We're going to talk about this with the Bucks in a second. But they have to be able to score in the half court. If not, they're not going to win this series. Because Boston has some elite defenders in the half court. Give me Brown and Tatum on anybody. And they don't have that guy in Kawhi Leonard who you can give the ball to in the fourth quarter and say, please, God, go get us a bucket. Toronto got outscored by 11 in the fourth quarter. 32 to 21. And they lost by three. When the game slows down, the team that executes in the half court better, and and a lot of times meaning the guy who's the best at getting his own shot, the the team with the guy that's best at getting his own shot, i.e. Kawhi Leonard, i.e. Jason Tatum, i.e. Jimmy Butler, is going to have the edge in late in playoff games. 
they're going to have to find a way to score better in the half court. Because Boston wasn't, I mean, they shot 15 of 38 from the three-point line. They were better in that category and better from the free throw line. But you're not going to shoot 40% against the Celtics and win a series. It's not going to happen. Miami Heat, 115-104. Jimmy Butler, 40 points on 13 of 20 shooting. A gamer. I still have my reservations about whether or not Jimmy Butler can be the best player on a, on a championship team. Especially a team like this where like there's a lot of young players. I mean, Bam, Bam 12, 17, and 6. But there's just not... I mean, Drogic has played phenomenally in the playoffs. He had 27 again last night. But when your second 25-point guy is just a little bit up in the air, I'm not sure how I feel about Jimmy Butler leading you to a championship. But here's the thing about Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler is a big shot taker, a big shot maker, and can create his own shot in the half court when things are slow. A couple things. One, we'll just we'll start with his stats. Giannis, 18 points, 10 rebounds, 9 assists, 6 of 12 shooting, 4 of 12 from the three-point line. First of all, Budenholzer, you should be fired if he plays less than 38 minutes again. Why is he only playing 37 minutes? This Bucks team is not better than the Heat outside of Giannis and maybe Chris Middleton. The Heat are better almost in every other category. Not on the defensive end, but Giannis has to be on the floor for longer than that. He can't be on the bench for a quarter of these games. That's essentially what it was. 48 minutes in an NBA game. He was on the bench for 11 of them. Why? He's one of the most in-shape people in the NBA. He's only played, what are we at now? 13, 14 games in the last six months. Why is he only playing 37 minutes per game? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Put him on the freaking floor. On the other side of things, it's Giannis didn't get any better in the places he needed to get better to be harder to guard in the playoffs. The Bucks won the fourth quarter or the first quarter by 11. They had eight fast break points. Giannis was very good because he was in transition the entire time. He was getting to the rim. He was finding Kyle Korver in transition. He was great. Phenomenal. But when the game slows down, Giannis is a guy who can't shoot the three and can't shoot free throws. Four of 12 from from the free throw line. He missed more free throws than shots. Jimmy Butler. 100% from the three-point line, 13 of 20 from the field, and 12 of 13 from the free-throw line. Jimmy Butler was the best player on the floor in Game 1. If that continues, this series is over quickly. Giannis has to be the best player on the floor, and more importantly, he has to be the best player on the floor in the fourth quarter. And he wasn't. Not even kinda. He has to be better. Has to be better. He was non-existent in the fourth quarter. Like one of six. If that doesn't change, the Heat are winning this series. And that's with Chris. That's what Chris Middleton and Brandon and uh, Brooke Lopez combining for fifty-two. They played really well. You got very little from Giannis, especially in the fourth quarter, and you got everything from Jimmy Butler in the fourth quarter. That was the difference. That's got to change, or the Bucks aren't making it past the semifinals. It's not happening. Game two's tonight. This afternoon, 5.30, 6.30 Eastern. And we'll see if that changes. But here's here's the thing. 
if the Bucks are only scoring 15 fast break points and only 24 points in the paint, this this is going to be not... They were 16 of 35 from the three-point line. They shot 45%. The Heat were worse from the field and worse from the three-point line, but they had the better player in the fourth quarter and the guy who could actually get buckets instead of Giannis, who had six turnovers and has a, a tendency late in games to just try to bulldoze his way through the paint, get picked up by three NBA defenders, and lose the ball. He has that tendency. And if the Bucks want to keep up in this series, he's got to be better in the fourth quarter. It's that simple. But shouts to Jimmy Butler. He's a gamer. And I'm not a huge Jimmy Butler guy, but that dude is is for real and is a guy, even if I don't think he could lead a team to a championship, he's a guy I want on my team in the playoffs. Coming up next, we're going to talk to Chris Brown, 110 Sports. See what he has to say about the trade deadline. We're halfway through the season, and we'll ask him questions about all of that. Coming up next on the Jamal Show on 110sportsmedia.com. All right, I'm back. Thanks so much for joining us twitch.tv slash 110 sports 110 sports media.com slash live we got chris brown on the show today we got trade deadline uh has come and gone and there's some teams that made some money moves i can't i don't know off the top of my head what song that's from but you know what i'm talking about and uh here to discuss trade deadline and all things baseball is 110 sports is chris brown at c brown sports on twitter if you don't follow him you should chris how you doing doing great josh thanks for having me on really appreciate it I want to ask you something. Far away. If, if I told you at the beginning of the season that the Padres were going all in at the trade deadline, would you have believed me? I would have been very skeptical. I would have looked at you funny for a good five or six seconds before I started to take that seriously at all. I mean, nobody, you know, I, I always thought that there was a chance that the Padres could do something, especially with the expanded postseason. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a talented roster, but like to this level, I don't think anybody could have possibly expected. And then they go all in at the trade deadline, make these huge moves, acquire the best pitcher on the market, the best player dealt in advance of the trade deadline. I mean, they're going all in. And it's like it's an exciting thing for baseball because this is a really fun team to watch, no doubt about it. Before we get to the players that they actually acquired – uh, and what they had to give up to get them. What, what are the Padres doing this season that either you weren't expecting or that they're just doing better than they were supposed to that puts them in this position to feel like they can really make a run at this with some uh, with a couple big moves? Yeah. So I mean, first of all, I mean, there's, you know, I don't don't think you can start a conversation about the Padres without first talking about what we've seen from Fernando Tatis Jr. Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy has been. I would say probably the best all-around player in baseball this season. I mean, there's there's competition from a couple other guys, but he's been incredible. I mean, he's hitting 313. He's getting on base four out of ten times. He's stealing bases. He's hitting home runs. He's you know playing elite defense. I mean, he's a really energizing force and one of the best young players in baseball. So that's that's obviously a, a huge part of it. Uh, they're also getting great production out of Manny Machado. Uh, a guy who people may have, you know, I don't want to say forgotten about, but a guy who, you know, went to uh, San Diego and his numbers had never really, haven't really been the same since he left Baltimore. But mm-hmm. this year he's, he's you know, tearing it up at the plate, 11 homers, he's hitting 300. Uh, so you combine those two players on the left side, and uh, they've got the NL Rookie of the Year front runner in Jake Cronenworth, the second baseman who nobody had ever really heard of. Uh, mm-hmm. He's the NL front uh, the NL Rookie of the Year front runner. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got really that talent. Uh, there's been some, you know, inconsistency on the pitching side, uh, particularly in the bullpen, and that's something that they addressed at the deadline a little bit. Um, and you know, Will Myers also having a rebound year in the outfield. So really, it's just an Eric Hosmer at first base. There's just enough hitting talent there in particular mm-hmm. uh, that they could have gone multiple ways. That that just enough guys firing on all cylinders and have found another level. Uh, that's sort of bringing the Padres to a point that uh, I don't think anybody expected. So you've got you've added you know Mike Clevenger of course, which is the the big one, and, and really the you know every every season pretty much there's there's that move that says oh yeah that team they're going for it this is 
this is something they're trying to win a World Series. They're trying to really contend this year. And this year, the Padres going and getting Mike Clevenger was was part of it. They also added, you know, as you've mentioned in some of your stories, they've they've shored up all of the other places it, where they were weak. They added some catching. They added some DH in uh, Mitch Moreland. Part A of the question is, what was this Padres ceiling without these moves, and what is their ceiling now with with some of these areas of weakness really shored up? Yeah, so I mean, I think without the moves, this was still a really good baseball team, and one that could certainly, I mean, they're going to make the postseason uh, for the first time in several years, and, you know, it, this was a great team without those moves, but I think what these moves do is sort of, make them a real World Series caliber team. Now, I mean, I don't know if they're going to make it, of course. Um, you know, they're going to have to, you know, get through the Dodgers to right. probably to win the NL, uh, win the National League. But this sort of short, in, in shoring up those, those areas, particularly in adding Clevenger, that, that real ace that they didn't have, it makes this team, in my mind, a potential World Series contender. Mm -hmm. it, they're just very much well-rounded. I mean, you look at the – more well-rounded now. I mean, you look at the top teams in the National League, and you know, in particular the Dodgers. There's there's very few holes mm -hmm. in that roster, and you know, they have the starting pitching, they have the great offense, and and from what we've seen for the Padres this year, there's reason to believe that that offense is going to continue to be great with mm -hmm. Tatis, Machado, Hosmer, Cronenworth, Myers, so many bats in that lineup now. Moreland. Um, so we knew that that offense was probably going to be great the rest of the way, but they didn't have that that game one starter to go out there and oppose. Mm -hmm. Clayton Kershaw or somebody else to really uh, deliver with that huge performance. They have some intriguing arms, but not that sort of veteran presence who they know can go out there and be that stopper for them in that big game. And that's what they got in Clevenger. So now I think they really have the ability to go out there and make a deep postseason run, uh, a deep run in October. You know, I, I think that's with this sort of short postseason series, now you've got three guys. You start with Clevenger, then you've got to Nelson Lamott and, and Chris Paddock, and you've got three guys that you really feel good about throwing on the mound in a, in a short series when you need to win two out of three games. And, and, and honestly, you know, to nobody's fault, but a, a quite a fluky uh, three-game series. I mean, bad teams sweep good teams in three-game series in the middle of the regular season all the time. So it, shoring up that that side of things is certainly, it, it is certainly a good thing for the Padres, do you think this is the kind of thing that solidifies their their place in baseball for the next couple of years, or is this a is this a let's win now and worry about what what might happen next later? I think it's a little bit of both uh, because aside from Trevor Rosenthal, who is a rental for the rest of the season, then he'll become a free agent. Most of the guys they acquired have uh, some years of control. Uh, coming up, especially Clevenger, that's, of course, being a big one. He's under team control mm -hmm. through 2022. Gotcha. So that's not just their ace for this year. That's their ace for the next two to three years, and they've got some incredible pitching prospects coming up. Uh, you add in some of the additions of the, the catchers that they have are not necessarily just a this-year thing either. They're under control for a few more years. So mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit of both. It's them seeing an opportunity to, you know, look, we're really competitive now. We have a shot to make a run at this. And, you know, we're, we're only a few moves away from, from being that World Series caliber team. So they went out and made them. Mm -hmm. But it also wasn't just a pure rental thing where I, I definitely see them being set up in a much better place, uh, particularly in that rotation with some of the prospects they have coming up and some of the other pitchers around Clevenger. Uh, for this to be a move that sets the Padres up to be successful in a way we haven't seen for the next several years. How do you feel about so, – so they didn't have to give up – a lot of their major league baseball players to make the moves that they did. But as you mentioned in your winners and losers at 110sportsmedia.com is they give up nearly a third of their top 30 prospects. How do you, where do you stand on, on that? I mean, you also mentioned here that this is something you should, you know, you can and should do when you get a chance to compete for a world series like this. But where do you stand on, on that, on the risk and and the move of giving up a lot of your farm system to go get a World Series now or try to. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's it's sort of it's it's 
depends on the situation and what your farm system is and what you think your your window is. Because mm-hmm. you know, if you're in a situation where you you know you don't have a really great farm system and you've got a couple top prospects and that you know they could be they're really crucial for you that they kind of pan out because you don't have a lot of a depth in your farm system. And then sort of trading away those guys for just rentals or, or just to really go mm-hmm. for it, and then all of a sudden your farm system is really depleted. I feel like that's often a mistake that's made. Uh, but I feel like the Padres situation, the circumstances aligned where, you know, one, this is a team that hasn't been competitive in recent years, so, it, you know, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a spot where, it, you know, like they're in a position to really to make an impact, to make a deep postseason run. They have they had that kind of talent already on the roster, so, so adding in a couple guys can really make a difference. Mm-hmm. And then you add in the fact that they had one of the top farm systems in baseball already. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a top, I, would, I think most rankings had them as you know like a top three top five farm system already Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you do that then taking away a number of players from that obviously it's a hit but they're still going to have an above average farm system a good group of prospects um, left after that Uh, and then you know there's also like you know like you mentioned there's there's risk involved um, but you have to kind of have that confidence and general man the general manager for the Padres A.J. Preller has shown a willingness to go out and make these moves to take these chances uh, but it's you know it's a confidence you know this is kind of part of the reason why you develop a great farm system so you have mm-hmm. this flexibility obviously you know in a different situation maybe everybody comes up and performs and you have this incredible young talent but you this is another benefit you have to developing that talent and uh, their general manager saying you know saying look we have a chance to win now uh, but also set us, set ourselves up for the future and still maintain an above average farm system. So mm-hmm. I think with all that there, um, it certainly made sense to do. And I'm certainly on the in the boat of agreeing with that. That like, look, you want to have a good farm system, but at some point, you know, this is a chance for them to compete that that they haven't had, and they're still going to be set up with a lot of good young players as well. I, I suppose it's helpful that I mean, you you talk about the the left side of that infield with Manny Machado and. and... Fernando Tatis Jr., that those are both still relatively young players. I mean, Machado's 28, but, you know, you can still be knocking the cover off the, the baseball well into your 30s. And Tatis, of course, is, you know, has been able to drink in this country for, you know, six months. So it's so it's not like you've got guys on the back half of their prime that you're trying to capitalize on. You're sort of going after it when you've got a guy like Fernando Tatis who is just – destroying the league at the age of 21 which is not which you don't see all that often so you've still got a lot of time and young players to build around if you don't end up getting a world series with with these moves so if i told you that you weren't allowed to pick the padres who is the who's your next winner at the trade deadline of course it's the padres and like in the Western Conference the last five years, of course it was the Warriors that were going to come out. But if I made you pick a team that's not the Warriors or not the Padres, uh, who's your winner at the trade deadline? Yeah, I'm going to go with the Blue Jays as my – they were my sort of runner-up winner of the mm-hmm. deadline. Mm-hmm. And, and their trades didn't get as much attention as the Padres deal because they didn't include a player of the caliber of Mike Clevenger. There was no flashy deal, but they addressed a number of different uh, areas, of, areas of need. And this is a, a really exciting young team – as well, a team that is uh, 18 and 16 right now, so they're not, you know, lighting the world on fire, but they're having a pretty good year. It's very much in the playoff hunt right now, mm-hmm. and they went out and acquired some players to fill areas of need. Need they got Major League Baseball stolen base leader Jonathan VR. He's very versatile uh, from the Marlins, and uh, they needed a middle infielder, an infielder to help with shortstop Bo Bichette out from out with injury for a couple more weeks at least. Uh, so mm-hmm. he fills a need there. Uh, they also had real holes in that rotation behind uh, behind Hyunjin Ryu uh, because they lost a number of, of players, including a top prospect in that rotation. So they went out and took some low-risk, high-reward uh, players mm-hmm. uh, in, in trades. Uh, Robbie Ray has been one of the better left-handers starters in baseball for a couple years now. Uh, he's really struggled this year, but uh, there's a you know he's got high upside. A Taiwan, Taiwan Walker from Seattle. And then uh, Hunter uh, Ross Stripling from the Dodgers. Uh, none of these are like big name star starting pitchers, but mm-hmm. they didn't necessarily need that. They've got a great offense or the potential for a great offense. And they just needed some durable arms in that rotation mm-hmm. uh, to provide innings and upside. Uh, so I think that's a team uh, that uh, has done well to, without spending a bunch of a bunch of, in terms of money and prospects, uh, help shore up 
some areas of need. So, so death taxes and the Yankees being banged up in September. Are you, are you, are you disappointed in their inaction? Um, now, I suppose when you've got the roster that you do, you, it's easy to convince yourself that you need no moves. But you just talked about sharing up with with durable arms, and maybe the Yankees sharing themselves up with somebody who just doesn't get hurt very often at all would have been would have been a, a smart thing to at least consider. Thoughts on the Yankees' action, or I suppose inaction at the deadline? Yeah, I was a bit surprised to see the Yankees do absolutely nothing at the trade deadline. Obviously, like you mentioned, they're just incredibly banged up right now uh, from Judge to Stanton to Torres to Paxton. Uh, so many guys sidelined right now. And that's something they, they had a lot of injuries last year. This isn't, you know, a lot of injuries isn't necessarily a new thing for the Yankees. Right. And they have a roster that's so deep and that has been great talent that they can afford that to some extent, to, to, you know, to sort of wait that, wait that out a little bit. But at the same time, they were a team that I was surprised left so much to chance. You know, mm-hmm. there's a chance that some of these players, as who are injured, come back and are big contributors down the, you know, down the final weeks of the season and in the postseason. But there's real risk in that because we only have a couple of weeks left before the postseason, really. Um, and some of these players, these injuries could, could be pretty serious. They could pop back up again. And so right now there's not a lot of starting pitching depth of great talent behind Derek Cole, of course, one of the best pitchers in baseball mm-hmm. at the top of the rotation. But um, with behind him, there's not a lot of – there's not that incredible game two starter for them. They're also relying on, like, a 195 career hitter at shortstop right now with Flavor mm-hmm. Torres out. Right. And he could be back soon, but – there's just like a part of me that's like, you know, the Yankees, they have this resources, these resources that have that great team. Why are they leaving so much up to chance? Why couldn't they, why didn't they feel it was important to add that second arm? Uh, so I was a little bit disappointed in them, but, you know, look, they're still one of the better teams in the AL. I could easily see them making a big run for sure. So there are one, two, three, four, there are four divisions in baseball in which the, the, team at the top is leading by three or three and a half games you got the Rays in the AL East um, the the Athletics in the AL West the Braves in the NL East and the Cubs in the NL Central my question is do those teams that are sitting pretty three and three three and a half games ahead of their uh, their opponents in, in their division uh, do, does anybody get caught or would you bet on those four teams that I just named to, to win those divisions? Yeah, uh, let's see. I would say as far as the AL West, I would not be surprised to make, see the Astros make a run. Uh, they're a couple games back of the A's. Mm-hmm. And the A's, I think, are a really great team. Uh, but I could see them losing their grip on that. Either way, they're making the playoffs, so to some extent it doesn't really right. matter. But right. I could see the Astros making a run there because after a really slow start, they're performing much more like the team that everybody expected them. Uh, the NL East, also a division that's a bit wide open. I think the Braves are the best team there, but the Phillies uh, made some additions to their bullpen at the trade deadline. Uh, I could see them making a run. I, I still would bet on the Braves to win that division. I definitely would bet on the Cubs to win the NL Central. Uh, the rest of that division really hasn't been all that competitive. I mean, the Cardinals are one game over 500. Everybody else is below 500. The Reds, the Brewers haven't found any real success this year. Uh, so I'm still betting on the Cubs to win that one. The Dodgers are definitely not getting caught. In right. my, I, mean, I believe even with the Padres move, I mean, they're five games back. That's not insurmountable, but, like, I don't see this. Even if the Padres go on a sensational run, which they could, I don't see the Dodgers, you know, dropping off that much. Right. So I think the Dodgers have the NL West, uh, and I think the Cubs have the NL Central. Overall, I think the AL the, 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 is where we could see some changes. Uh, the Yankees could make a run to be, you know, over the Rays who are really banged up, mm-hmm. um, and the Astros could make a run over the A's. But generally speaking, I think the playoffs are a lot more set right now than a lot of people might realize. Chris, it's always a pleasure, buddy. Uh, always enjoy talking baseball with you. Yeah, absolutely, Josh. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. That's Chris Brown, 110sportsmedia.com's baseball expert. He's great. At C. Brown Sports on Twitter, if you're not following him, you should. It's it's a must-follow, in my opinion, if you're a baseball fan and want to keep up with what's going on in that league. Coming up next, we'll do some FYI. i got a couple things I want to talk about. All right. Kirk Cousins being one of them. Well, we'll do that next on The Jamal Show on 110sportsmedia.com. For your information, Kirk Cousins, I'm talking to you. 
I know. It's a widely popular show, and I'm sure he'll be watching. But Kirk Cousins. So first of all, let me give you some context. Kirk Cousins went uh, talked to Kyle Brandt uh, on his podcast. Kyle Brandt, uh, Good Morning Football guy. It's uh, he's the host of Ten Questions on Spotify and The Ringer. He had Kirk Cousins on, spoke to him, and Kirk essentially said that masks are stupid. And then he went on this this speech about how if I die, I die. When it's my time, it's my time. You know, I don't think a mask is necessary. Okay. He said, survival of the fittest kind of approach and just say if it knocks me out, it knocks me out. I'm going to be okay. You know, he said, I'd say I'm going to go about my daily life. If I get it, I'm going to ride it out. That's cool. Whatever you want to do. But here's the thing, and here's the thing that, and, and I, I'm not going to talk about this for very long because I'm tired of talking about COVID-19. But here's the thing about what Kirk Cousins just said. And this is something that most people are failing to understand. You're not wearing the mask for you. You're wearing the mask for the people that are in the superstore with you. You're wearing the mask for the people who are also standing in line to get their coffee prior to work. You're wearing the mask for the people on the subway. You're wearing the mask for the people on the bus. You're wearing the mask for the people in the elevator with you. You're not wearing your mask for you. You wearing your mask is not going to stop you from getting COVID-19. That's not what it will do, though, is prevent you. First of all, Kirk Cousins saying that they're not necessary is stupid because they're clearly, an, you know, look wherever you want. Everywhere it says that the masks help the transmission of the virus. But the mask is to keep the people around you safe. And that's what Kirk Cousins doesn't realize here. Whatever, you don't want to wear a mask because you don't think, like, it's not helping you. That's the whole point. And why this is so hard is because people just don't look out for each other. Wear your mask so that the person next to you doesn't get sick. If you're sick and you don't know it. Because if you're sick and you don't know it, but you're wearing a mask, you're, the chances of you infecting somebody are much, much lower. But if you're sick and you go into a superstore or you go into the or you go into into the team facilities and you breathe on somebody you could get them sick and even if you don't know you're sick now Kirk Cousins not knowing he's sick is a much lower probability than than any non-football player with how much they're getting tested but but wear your mask because it's helping the people next to you and just look out for each other. That's why you wear a mask. So that just in case you have it and you don't know it, you're able to keep yourself and others safe. People are Other people are wearing their masks so they don't get you sick. And you're wearing your mask so you don't get other people sick. So try to have some... Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. If you don't care about getting it, fine. But somebody else who might have asthma or some other underlying condition that makes the virus much more deadly for them, they're not having they're not approaching it like that. They're also not the physical specimen that is required to be an NFL player. That's all I'm saying. But let's just try to look out for each other a little bit more than that, please. A little bit more than that. There are 26 different logos for the 2828 LA Olympics. Organizers plan on using all 26 that they have received, with more expected over the next eight years. That's crazy, and and, and I can't I, I I could show you this, but I don't have it set up. It's got a, a lot of different A's in there for the LA. It, it's really cool. It is, but it, it's just it, it's making me laugh that there are so many different so many different logos from a group of artists, athletes, a chef, a fashion designer, designing a bunch of them for the 2028 Olympic Games. That's kind of funny. Um, it's not something that I would ex <laughs> expect to see. 
but uh, so you're gonna right now there are 26 Olympic logos for the 2028 LA Olympics, and then of course tomorrow, right here at 110 sportsmediacom slash live touchline talk with Josh Doring at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then you just heard him on this show. You'll hear him again tomorrow on his show, Chris Brown, Around the Bases, 1 p.m. Eastern. Both of those shows right here, 110sportsmedia.com slash live, twitch.tv slash 110sports. Thank you so much for joining us here on a Wednesday. Please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I'll see you guys back here 11 a.m. Eastern on Friday.